If you could turn with me in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 18, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 12. Please stand with me. The title to our message this morning is The Conversion of Jethro. Beginning in verse 1. Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Now Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, had taken Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her home, along with her two sons. The name of the one was Gershom, for he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. And the name of the other was Eliezer, for he said, The God of my father was my help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses in the wilderness where he was encamped at the mountain of God. And when he sent word to Moses, I, your father-in-law Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons with her. Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and bowed down and kissed him. And they asked each other of their welfare and went into the tent. Then Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all the hardship that had come upon them in the way and how the Lord had delivered them. And Jethro rejoiced for all the good that the Lord had done to Israel in that he had delivered them out of the hand of the Egyptians. Jethro said, "'Blessed be the Lord.'" who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh and has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods because in this affair they dealt arrogantly with the people. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. Grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Let's pray. Father, as we heard just a moment ago about those four soils, Lord, we pray that this morning we would not be that soil on the path that was trodden down and eaten by birds, the seeds, we pray that we would not be that soil that had no moisture in it, that the roots couldn't go down. We pray that we wouldn't be that soil, Lord, that was choked out by thorns. For our desire is to be the good soil that produces 30, 60, and 100-fold fruit. So, Lord, prepare our hearts now. We confess once again that this is a spiritual, supernatural event, and we cannot hear from you unless you give us ears to hear. We ask that you would do that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. So it's been a minute since we've been in Exodus. If you recall, the last time we were in it together was in November before Advent. And the last time we were here, we saw that the Amalekites had attacked Israel in the wilderness, seeking to destroy them. That's how chapter 17 ends. So in contrast to that hatred towards the gospel, now we see Jethro coming out to the Israelites because he had heard what God had done. And in the end, we see him rejoicing and worshiping and offering sacrifices to God. And so this antithesis here of hatred at the end of chapter 17 and love at the beginning of chapter 18 teaches us something really important, that there's no neutrality when it comes to the gospel. Dutch theologian um, Brockle said this, quote, consider first of all that there are but two kings in the world, each having a kingdom the kingdoms of Christ and of the devil, which are mortal enemies to each other. A third kingdom does not exist. Every person upon earth is either a subject of King Jesus 
or of the devil, the prince of darkness. No matter who you are individually, you are truly a subject of one of these two kingdoms. You are neither neutral nor a subject of both kingdoms simultaneously. Therefore, to which kingdom do you presently belong? End quote. The Amalekites showed which kingdom that they belonged to. But here in our passage this morning, we see that Jethro transfers his kingdom membership. He experiences conversion. I probably don't remember, but back in chapter 2, I I speculated and I said that it seems that Jethro worshipped the true and living God, but I believe that I was mistaken. Look with me at verse 11. After he hears all of these reports, what does he say? Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods. He didn't know that before, but now he knows. So this is Jethro's conversion story. And that word conversion is found in the New Testament in Acts chapter 15, verse 3. Paul and Barnabas were returning on one of their missionary journeys, and we read that they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles. That word conversion, if you look it up in the lexicon, it means revolution. Conversion is a revolution. It's a turning from dead idols to serve the true and living God. Listen to how the Heidelberg Catechism puts it in question 88. It asks, what is involved in genuine conversion? Two things, the dying away of the old self and the rising to life of the new. Conversion is being brought into the kingdom of God. Conversion happens when a man who once hated God, ran from God, loved his wickedness, now says from the depths of his soul, whom have I in heaven but you? And on earth, there is nothing I desire besides you. Conversion is once being a stranger to the covenant of promise, being without hope, without God in the world. And it's now being able to say, I know that my Redeemer lives And at the last, he will stand upon the earth. Conversion is the soul's revolution. It's the soul's birth into God and into Christ. It's into heaven and into everlasting life. It is simply the greatest miracle that happens on planet earth today. And this miracle of Jethro's conversion is greater than all the other miracles that we saw in the Exodus. And the only reason why we disbelieve that is because we haven't been taught well this miracle of the new birth. That's what happens to Jethro in our passage this morning. So here's our outline. We're going to see three things. Conversion ought to be the labor of every Christian. Conversion comes with supernatural joy and love. And conversion brings the soul into communion with God. So let's look first at how conversion ought to be the labor of every Christian. Starting off here, many commentators speculate that Moses and Zipporah had a falling out early on in the book of Exodus. Remember that bridegroom of blood incident in chapter 4. The Lord was going to kill Moses because he didn't circumcise his younger son, on account of his wife not wanting to. But Zipporah, Moses was sleeping, finally acquiesced and did the deed, threw the foreskin at his feet and said, you're a bridegroom of blood to me. And then these same commentators speculate that Zipporah at that point went back to her father um, Jethro in Midian while Moses went to Egypt. We do know that she went back at some point. Look at uh, verse 2. Now Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, had taken Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her home. Some Jewish rabbis believe that this sending back here meant that Moses divorced her. Now, 
far as I can tell, this is just like wild speculation. Um, our, our passage indicates the opposite. Jethro refers to Zipporah as Moses' wife, at least twice, once in verse 6, once in verse 5. He's not his ex-wife. It's not his wife that he put away. Um, so so the, the two questions that, that are important here is, when did Moses send his, his wife back to Jethro, and why did he send her? So when and why? So when did Moses send her home? My answer is that he sent her home sometime after Israel was delivered from Egypt, sometime after chapter 15, sometime after the Red Sea, after they were already living in the wilderness. It was Moses' express purpose to bring them, his wife and children, to Egypt. Just note this in your head, Exodus 4.20, Moses took his wife and his sons and went back to the land of Egypt. Moses knew what God said was going to happen. He had the whole burning bush experience. He told him he was going to bring down this nation and he was going to plunder the Egyptians and they were going to go out. Calvin says here that Moses would have never allowed his sons to be deprived of the redemption which God was going to accomplish. Would you? Would you deprive your children and your wife of seeing the greatest event in the ancient world? Oh yeah, just go home. No, he would not let his family miss it. Beside this whole ordeal had everything to do with his family. Zipporah was his wife by covenant. His children were covenant children. They were a part of God's covenant people. This had everything to do with them. And so Moses only sent her back after the whole ordeal was accomplished. Later during family worship, you can flip back to the maps in the back of your Bible and you can actually see that this actually makes sense geographically too because the, the wilderness of Sinai is right next to Midian. This is where they were at. They were at the mountain of God, end of verse 5 says, and probably while they were camping there, Moses just sent her across the border to her family's house. So then why? That's the when. Why did Moses send her home? I think that part's actually easy. Because Jethro was part of their family. Moses and Zipporah and their sons loved Jethro. I mean, if you were gone for several months out of state and you came back into the state where your parents were, would you go see them? Of course you would. This is a natural occurrence here. But more importantly, the reason why Moses had sent her back is because they had some good news to share with Jethro. Jethro was oblivious as to what was going to happen in Egypt. We read in chapter 4, verse 20, when Moses went and asked for permission, this is actually in verse 18, when he asked for permission to go, what did he tell Jethro? He said, can can I go back and see if my brothers are still alive? He knew his brothers were alive. I mean, God told him they were alive and that he was going to be the instrument of redemption. He didn't let him on and what was going to happen at all. This was brand new news to Jethro. So Jethro must be told about Yahweh who overturned an empire and redeemed his people. That's the emphasis in verse 1. Look at verse 1 with me. Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard, he heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people. Who did he hear this from? Well, certainly we know that there were caravans going across the country. This news was going to be proclaimed in all the earth. No doubt about that. But Jethro had firsthand testimony from his daughter and his grandsons who were there, who saw it with their own eyes. Children, boys and girls, if you were in their shoes, in Gershom's and Eliezer's shoes, and you saw everything that you saw in Egypt, would you keep that to yourselves? My kids can't even watch a Marvel movie without saying, did you see that part? 
They saw the greatest miracles in the world. That would have been all that they talked about. It would have been, Grandpa, we saw with our eyes things that nobody's ever seen. We heard with our ears things that nobody's ever heard. We saw water turn to blood. We saw frogs and lice and locusts ruin the land of Egypt. But we in the land of Goshen were protected by the hand of God. We saw the firstborn of Egypt slain, but we were saved by the Passover lamb, by the blood of the lamb. We saw God part the Red Sea, and we walked on dry land, and we saw God drown Pharaoh and the army, and we will never see them again. Jethro heard what had happened. And this hearing of the good news drew Jethro's soul. So he decided that he was going to accompany his daughter back to see this site with his own eyes. Look at verse 5. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses in the wilderness where he encamped at the mountain of God. And he sent word to Moses saying, I, your father-in-law, Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons with her. So how does Moses respond to this coming? First, he responds by loving Jethro. Look at verse 7. Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and bowed down and kissed him. And they asked each other of their welfare and went into the tent. Now remember at this point, as far as Moses, is, Moses knows, this is still a priest of Midian. He's still a priest of a pagan god. He was outside of the covenant. And what does Moses do? He genuinely loves him. He cares for him. He brings him into his own home. He shows him respect. He asks him about his life. He embraces him and gives him deep affection. One author says here, quote, Moses knew how to love someone who was outside of the family of faith. And that's the first vital part of evangelism. We must have a true love and concern for the lost. We must have a true love and concern for the lost. Oh, loved ones, this is precisely how Jesus was. On a number of accounts, he uh, um, encounters unconverted people, and he pours out love and affection on them. One of them is, is the woman at the well. He's not just like spitfire throwing gospel bullets at her. He says, go, go to your home, get your husband, and come back to me. Or to the rich young ruler who ends up walking away in unbelief. The text says that he looked at the young man and he loved him. We don't even know if he ever became converted, but Jesus loved the young man. God wants us to show love and concern and care for the unconverted. Loved ones, this is why he sent his son into the world. God so loved the world. God loved the world of unconverted people. And the proof for that is us. We were unconverted. And we were brought into the kingdom of God through the love of God and his care and compassion towards us. If he he hadn't have done that, we would have never been saved. So examine yourself. Is that how you treat the unconverted? Do you show your love for them? Do you show your concern for them? Do you... Can they sense that you really care for them? Do they walk away from an encounter with you and say, man, those Christians, they really do love people. I know I've felt it that a thousand times. This is why we have passages like this, to recalibrate how we think and how we act around unconverted folk. Secondly, Moses didn't stop there. Moses told Jethro the gospel. Look at verse 8. Then Moses told his father-in-law all 
that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all the hardship that had come upon them in the way, and how the Lord delivered them. And at this point, you might say here, well, I don't see the word gospel anywhere in this passage. Well, loved ones, it's in the shadow form. What did God do for Israel? He redeemed them. What did God do to that dragon called Egypt? He destroyed him. What did God do after redemption? He provided for them. That's the gospel. Moses was telling Jethro the good news that there is a God who saves, and this is the second vital part of evangelism. We must actually proclaim the gospel to the lost. We must actually proclaim the gospel to the lost. The gospel story must be told. I was in a church where the pastor used to say, well, your life is the gospel. No, if my life is the gospel, that's really bad news because you will all go to hell. My life is not the gospel. Christ, what Christ did, what Christ accomplished, his death, burial, and resurrection, that's the gospel. Yes, we must show our love and concern for the lost, but we must go further. We must actually speak to them. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. This is Paul's whole argument in Romans 10. He says, how are they to believe in him whom they have never heard? It's a really simple question. Can they believe if they've never heard the promise of Christ? No, they can't. And then he goes on further to ask, how are they to hear without someone preaching? Zipporah and Gershom and Eliezer and Moses labored for Jethro's conversion by proclaiming the gospel to him. And so here's our charge. Labor for the conversion of the lost. Labor for it. Love those who are outside of Christ. Just as God showed his love to us while we were still sinners, we are to show our love to the unconverted while they are still sinners. Show them the compassion of Christ and then give them the gospel. Give them the words of the gospel. Who is obligated to this charge? Well, all of us are. Children... Boys and girls, I don't know how old Moses' two sons were, but they labored for the conversion of their grandfather. Children, sharing the gospel with others is not for adults only. It's for children. It's for boys and girls just like you. The Bible is full of places where children are sharing the gospel. There's a story of a little slave girl who helped lead Naaman, who was a, the general of the Syrian army, to the Lord in First Kings, 2 Kings 5, 3 through 5. It was a little boy who helped Jesus feed 5,000 people as, as he's teaching them the gospel in John 6, 9. Children, when you speak the gospel to the lost, there is power in the words. There's power in the very name of Jesus. You know that when Jesus is going about, when his name is being proclaimed, the demons tremble at his very name. This power doesn't come from you, but this power can flow through you as you preach and share The gospel. Who else is obligated? Well, dear sisters in Christ, ladies, you must also labor for the conversion of the lost. No doubt it was also Zipporah who was sharing the gospel with her father. Evangelism is not for men only. Um, It was Mary Magdalene, a woman who first proclaimed the news of the resurrected Christ, the first Preacher of the gospel was Mary Magdalene. We also see in Acts, Priscilla, a woman who helped her husband tell Apollos the way of Christ more accurately. Acts 15, 26. Sisters, how many unsaved Jethros are still in your family? Love them, serve them, look and pray for opportunities to share the gospel with them. Who else is obligated? Men. Brothers, labor. 
Labor for the conversion of the lost. But we need to take Moses' example here. We must start with our own family. Moses started with his own family. He started with Jethro. One author says here, quote, All too often, Christian leaders pursue their call to ministry at the expense of their families. But family life is also a divine calling. Brothers, one of, the, one of the great blessings of family worship that we're pressing here this particular year is that every time you do family worship, you're laboring, you're working for conversion, the conversion of your children, not only for their conversion, but the conversion of children's children and the conversion of every single person that they will influence. When, when Jethro was converted to the Lord, how many people did that affect when he went back to Midian? This isn't an argument against evangelizing to strangers. It's not an argument against a missionary work. On the contrary, it's an argument to do those glorious things in the most effective way. Brothers, if we succeed by the grace of God, by the grace of God, if we succeed in converting our family members, we will affect generations Yes, labor to convert others. Yes, do that with all zeal. But begin, as Moses did, with his own family. And that's our first point, that conversion ought to be the labor of every Christian. Let's look secondly, how conversion comes with supernatural joy and love. How did Jethro respond to all this gospel preaching? Well, he was converted. There are three specific acts that Jethro does. He rejoices, he worships, and he confesses. So let's look at those one at a time. First of all, Jethro rejoices. Look at verse 9. And Jethro rejoiced for all the good that the Lord had done to Israel in that he delivered them out of the hand of the Egyptians. He rejoiced. The Hebrew word is a very peculiar one. One Jewish source says here that the, the verb is rendered as he felt cuts in his body. He felt cuts in his body, in his, on his body, in his body. He was electrified. It was a joy that he had never felt before. Remember, some some of you were converted to Christ later on in life. What joy did you experience? It was a joy that he never felt before. It was a divine joy because for the first time, he was drinking from the Holy Spirit. Secondly, Jethro worshiped. Look at verse 10. Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh and has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Typically in Scripture, when men bless the Lord, uh, it means that they kneel before him, that they adore him, they exalt him, they worship him. Furthermore, Jethro addresses the Lord here by that covenant name, Yahweh. He's saying, bless Yahweh, not a generic God, the God of the covenant, the God of the Israelites. He's giving God all the glory for Israel's salvation. Thirdly, Jethro confesses. Look at verse 11. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods. Because in this affair, they dealt arrogantly with the people. Now here is the key word. Now the issue is settled for Jethro. Now he believes that Yahweh is the greatest God. And then he gives a reason why. Because, he says, Egypt dealt arrogantly with Israel. Jethro knew of the ruin of Egypt, and he concluded 
that only the true God could punish her in the way that he had. This is a a strange kind of apologetic. Only God can bring true justice on earth. You can line up Stalin and Lenin and Hitler and, and Mao and all those wicked villains and kill them a thousand times and it will never give true justice. And what Jethro is seeing here is that this nation was brought to true justice by the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and he renounces all other gods, and he makes Yahweh his Lord and God and Savior. Now, what I think is particularly helpful here is that Jethro shows us the nature of true faith. In order to be converted to Christ, in order for true conversion to take place, one must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what Paul told the Philippian jailer. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, you and your household. But what does it mean to believe? John Piper points out here in his book, Desiring God, he says this, quote, we are surrounded by unconverted people who think that they do believe in Jesus. Drunks on the street say they believe. Unmarried couples sleeping together say they believe. Elderly people who haven't sought worship or fellowship for 40 years say they believe. All kinds of lukewarm, world-loving church attenders say they believe. The world abounds with millions of unconverted people who say they believe in Jesus, end quote. What Piper is poking at here is that some people treat that word believe as mere mental agreement. Jethro did not have mere mental agreement. His faith included rejoicing and worshiping. Joy in God and love towards God was at the core of his faith. Galatians 5, 6, faith expresses itself in love. And here's my claim. Any faith that doesn't include those things is not true saving faith. It, it absolutely it is by faith alone and Christ alone that we are saved But we know from the Scripture that not all faith is equal. That passage that Pastor Ben read this morning in in Mark 4, in the the parable of the soil uh, with the uh, lack of moisture, that when, when Jesus interpreted it, it said, they believed, they received the word with joy, but when the sun came out, their the flower withered and died because they did not have a root in themselves. It was a false belief. Not all faiths are equal. James 2.19 says that the demons believe. And it says that they shudder. But demons are damned. Their faith is worthless. So what kind of faith is actually saving faith? Is mere mental agreement with the gospel saving? Well, we have that type of mental agreement with other things, don't we? I mean, we believe historical facts. We believe that George Washington was the first president. Not sure if there's a conspiracy theory on that one yet, but for now, we'll say he's the first president, right? But saving faith is never described in Scripture as believing like that. Saving belief is receiving Christ. John 1.12 But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children, boys and girls, what if I were to pull out of my wallet a check for one million dollars? That's a one with six zeros behind it. Probably a little more than you make in your allowance, right? $1 $1 million, and I were to give it to you, how would you receive that check? Thanks. 
You throw it in the corner on the ground with your other papers. Is that how you would receive it? How would you receive it? With joy, with thankfulness, with with rejoicing. That's reception. That's the reception that the gospel requires. Jonathan Edwards says it like this. The suitable receiving of that which is excellent, the gospel being excellent, is choosing it. It's loving it. The proper receiving of a Savior is committing ourselves to Him and trusting in Him. If a captain offers to deliver a distressed people, they that only believe what he says without committing themselves to him, putting themselves under him, cannot be said to receive him, end quote. Savingly believing in Jesus Christ means to receive him as the captain of your salvation, to choose him, to commit yourself to him, to put yourself underneath him, to quit all other hopes, to find him as all-satisfying and all-sufficient as your treasure. Another way of saying believe in the Lord Jesus Christ is saying delight yourself in the Lord. I want to press on this a little bit more. Why did Jethro rejoice? Why was his faith filled with love and joy and admiration? He heard all the stories. What in particular was it that made him rejoice? Was it just all the displays of God's mighty power? No, it was actually something more basic. It was the display of God's Grace. One author puts it like this. The story that Moses told Jethro was not about how the Israelites found their way back to God. Instead, it was a story about how God reached down in their muck and in their sin and depravity and rescued them. Jethro knew what kind of people the Israelites were. They they did nothing. They earned nothing. They merited nothing to be saved. They were idolaters just like the Egyptians. They were great sinners just like the Egyptians. Certainly Moses told him how the Israelites, after they got out of the Red Sea, within three days they were murmuring against God, complaining against God, telling God to leave them alone, and yet God redeemed them anyway. Oh, loved ones, this is the grace of the gospel. Who is it that has sinned against God? It's we. We have. And yet he still loves us. Can you even, can you fathom it? Has that truth hit you recently that we are the ones who have rebelled against God? We are rotten as hell. We're deserving of everlasting punishment. God knows all of our secret sins, all of those things that we are most ashamed about that we don't want anybody to know. And yet, out of that darkness, he brought us into light. Out of that death, he raised us from the dead and he converted us and he put his spirit in us. That's why Jethro rejoiced. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works of righteousness that we have done, but according to His own mercy. That's why true saving faith rejoices. It can't help but to rejoice. It sees a God who, though we have sinned against Him, He loves us still. That's our second point. That conversion comes with supernatural joy and love. Thirdly, conversion brings the soul into communion with God. Look at verse 12 with me. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God. Let's stop there. This is where the gospel is most clear in our passage. Jethro brought a burnt offering. Now, either he brought that animal from Midian or he purchased with his own money one of the animals from the Hebrews. He lays it on the altar, and that fire transforms the beast into particles that then ascend up into heaven where God is. Michael Morales says here, quote, 
The altar fire did not destroy the sacrificed animal. Rather, the fires transformed the blameless, vicarious substitute, causing it to ascend into Yahweh's presence in heaven. This word for burnt offering is so fascinating. The Hebrew lexicon signifies that this type of offering is a holocaust. A holocaust means going up in smoke. Jethro was offering a holocaust, a burnt offering that ascended into heaven where God was. Now remember, we saw the significance of the burnt offering during our Advent series. The first burnt offering in Scripture was after the flood in Genesis 8.20. The flood did not appease the wrath of God towards sin. And Noah took an offering and he burnt it as a whole offering to God. And when that holocaust ascended into heaven, it says that the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma. He was pleased. He was satisfied. The second burnt offering in Scripture was on Mount Moriah in Genesis 22. Abraham was told to bring his son as a burnt offering. But in the end, the angel of the Lord prevented him from doing so. Why? Why? Because Isaac was not qualified. He was a sinner. An innocent lamb was offered in his place, in his stead, as his substitute. In Leviticus 1.4, the significance of the burnt offering is made very clear. Listen carefully. Leviticus 1.4. He shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. Then he shall kill it before the Lord. No doubt this is what Jethro did here. He laid his hand on the animal's head and symbolically, if not verbally declared, this animal stands for me. His life for my life. Jethro did not come into the Lord's presence on his own merit. He was trusting in the same God that Abraham trusted in on Mount Moriah when he offered his burnt offering. He trusted in a God who would provide for himself the ultimate burnt offering, the Lord Jesus Christ. Loved ones, this is what a converted soul understands. He understands this truth, that the gospel is not for good people. Jethro was not a good man. The Israelites were not good people. No Christian alive today is good. We love the reformers. We love the Puritans. We love those pastors and theologians of the past, but they were not good. The scripture unequivocally says, there is no one who is good. No, not one. There is none that are righteous. There is none that seek God. They've all turned aside. They've become worthless. There's no one that's good, not even one. How can we then be saved? Jethro shows us Jesus Christ became the burnt offering for our sin. On that cross, he was consumed with the fiery wrath of God's indignation. He became a holocaust on the cross. God accepted it. Loved ones, God accepted the sacrifice of Christ on our behalf. There could be no greater news than you hear that this morning. Hebrews 10, 14 For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. We don't need to continue to re-sacrifice Christ in the Lord's Supper. That's what the the Roman Catholics believe. It's not a re-sacrificing of Christ. We believe that Christ was sacrificed once for all and that he perfected once for all those who are being sanctified. That's why we can rejoice like Jethro did. That's why we can say, bless the Lord. That's why we can say there is no one greater than this God. Loved ones, Jesus is greater than grace because no other God would ever pursue us while we were in sin. Jesus is greater in mercy because no other God would take on human flesh. Jesus is greater in love because no other God would ever offer himself on the altar in our place. And Jesus is greater in power because no other God would raise himself from the dead. I 
we do see here the final end and purpose of conversion. What's the final purpose of conversion? Look with me at the end of verse 12. And Aaron came with all the elders to eat bread with Moses, his father-in-law, before God. Clearly, Aaron, the high priest, and all the elders of Israel, and even Moses himself, accepted Jethro as one of them. They didn't just fellowship with Jethro, but they ate before God, meaning that this meal was a religious meal, was similar to what we would called Passover or the Lord's Supper. They ate in honor of God, in the presence of God, with God himself. Furthermore, it says that they ate bread. Calvin is certain here that this bread is the manna, that daily bread that God had provided. I don't know if that's true, but we know for certain that this bread typified Christ. He's not only the sacrifice for our sins, but he's the continual feast of our souls. Look, I don't, I don't know how much you're getting fed this morning, if it's a lot or it's a little, but here's the point. When you got saved, you didn't stop needing Christ. You still need to feast on him. And how do we feast? We feast by hearing. We feast by going to the table and eating and drinking. We feast. We never stop feasting on Christ. This is the communion that conversion ultimately consummates in. This is what conversion accomplishes. And one day that communion with God will be perfected. We'll see Christ face to face in his kingdom. We'll eat with him and drink with him. It's a consummated marriage supper of the lamb. What a day of rejoicing that will be. Many will come from the east and the west and recline at table with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. The dwelling place of God will finally be with men. We will eat and drink with God forever and ever, world without end. That's our third point, that conversion brings the soul into communion with God. So loved ones, let's just review our time together. First, we saw that conversion ought to be the labor of every Christian. It is the witness of history that the greatest evangelists and missionaries were Reformed folk. That's not to say they were only Reformed folk, but they were. Christ did not save us so that we could keep the good news to ourselves. The purpose of redemption is that the whole earth would be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. How does that happen? Through gospel proclamation. Labor for the conversion of your family. Love them. Speak to them. Labor for the conversion of others. Secondly, we saw that conversion comes with supernatural joy and love. Jethro here shows us what true faith looks like. It is receiving Christ, not as a mere mental agreement with the facts of the gospel, but it's faith that rejoices, it's faith that loves, it's faith that worships, it's faith that hungers and thirsts for Jesus. Have you received Christ like that? Lastly, we saw that conversion brings the soul into communion with God. This is the greatest motive for laboring for conversion because outside of conversion, those neighbors, those family members, those strangers will be lost in hell and everlasting misery forever. Look, we're not, we're not Arminian here. We don't believe that conversion ultimately depends upon us. But we do believe that the gospel being preached is a means of bringing people into the kingdom. Conversion alone opens up the kingdom of God, and conversion alone brings souls back to God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this great story of 
Jethro's conversion. God, that you care about men and families and women and children in history. Here, we've just spent multiple chapters looking at the great miracles in Egypt, and we come across this conversion story, and we might think it's nothing compared to what we've seen, but Lord, it's the exact opposite. This is what everything that you were aiming at, the restoring of men to paradise with you the bringing of men and women and children back into the garden to walk with you and fellowship with you in the cool of the day, have man restored to God. So Lord, help us this week. Help us in family worship. Help us to labor for the conversion of our children. Help us to labor for the conversion of our spouses and our parents and our aunts and uncles and our cousins, our co-workers. Help us to be wise as serpents as Moses was. Help us to love them. Help help us to be with them in such a way where they would walk away and they they, they couldn't argue with the fact that they know that they were just loved by a Christian. And help us to preach the, the gospel. Help us to know it in our own hearts. We thank you and we commit ourselves to you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.